Hello friends, this is Urmi Satin from School of Liberal Studies, PDEU and today I am going to present an analysis of a poem, The Lady of Shalott, written by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Tennyson's lifespan ranges from 1809 to 1892 and that is very much a Victorian period and so he is very much a Victorian poet. However, in his poetry we notice that along with the Victorian themes of lament, pessimism, rejection, loneliness and isolation, some elements of romanticism are also presented through the excellent symbolic vocabulary and artistic imagery. In some of his poems, Tennyson has also put up the issue of women's secondary status during his time. In the poem, The Lady of Shalott, the female persona is positioned in the Victorian frame. She is a lamenting lady living a lonely life in the Tower of Camelot, where once the historic assembly court of King Arthur used to be held. Throughout the poem, the tone of pessimism overpowers the romantic, picturesque imagery. The first stanza of the poem talks about the angelic beauty of river and barley and rye fields, the presence of water lilies and daffodilies and chili water surrounding the island of Shalott work majestically to exotify the island impact. Immediately after this exotic portrayal of the island, Tennyson presents the melancholic description of all the pale and lifeless natural objects. For example, the white willow barks and shivering trees and the grey walls and grey towers and the silent isle, everything that embowers the Lady of Shalott creates a gloomy atmosphere. We can clearly see that the female persona is isolated and she does not have an access to the beauty that surrounds the island. All throughout the poem we notice the scattered elements of angelic beauty like rose and margarine fence that decorate the aisle of the tower and the lady's pearl garland and velvet bed and royal apparel that add glory to her natural beauty. The epithet lady gives us an image of a rich high society woman whom we imagine as someone who must be living a lavish and luxurious life. But we find that her situation is in stark contrast to the richness that she is surrounded by. We see that the beauty and richness of island as well as that of the tower are not meant for her. She remains imprisoned inside the four grey walls. One more point of note, point to note is that there is no mention of her first name in the poem. The title lady speaks for the class that she belongs to, the status that the society has ascribed to her but her own individuality remains unattainable to her. With the second part of the poem, Tennyson makes the ambience more sullen by revealing to us that the lady has a curse on her and thus all amusing activities stay for her prohibited and she is left alone to meekly and steadily weave a charmed web. It is more sullen to note that the lady does not know the reason for the curse. The curse does not allow her to look beyond the Tower of Camelot. She is allowed to look at the world only through the reflections that are captured in a mirror hanging in front of her. She just keeps herself occupied and complacent, bereaved of all kinds of expressions. However, by the end of the poem we see that she emerges as a courageous person breaks her silence and proclaims, I am half sick of shadows. This proclamation is her outcry, her decision to revolt against her cursed confinement. The third part of the poem welcomes the blazing and glamorous entry of Sir Lancelot. Also with his entry, the mirror in the lady's chamber gets shattered by the shooting of an arrow most probably darted by the Lancelot himself. This incident of mirror shattering frightens her and she cries out, 
the curse is coming upon me. Part 4 of the poem talks about a series of dark and unpleasant happenings like the rough storm surge and the complaining banks of some broad stream and the heavy raining, etc. But in the middle of this stormy weather, Our Lady of Shalott shades off the garb of conventionality, takes a boat, inscribes her society inscribed epithet Lady of Shalott underneath it and thus resigns from her bonded and cursed life forever. Tennyson writes with a steady stony glance, like some bold seer in a trance, she loosed the chain and down she lay, the broad stream bore her far away. Thus, the Lady of Shalott flees the island of her captivity, sings death songs to herself, and embraces a self-chosen and peaceful death. Victorian age and the proverbial statement, the sun never sets on the British Empire, speaks for each other. The, nevertheless, it will not be wrong to say that Victorian time is the time of paradoxes. We see economic growth and political stability on one hand, and on the other, we also see conservatism, pessimism and skepticism. We can see these binaries in Tennyson's poems as well. On one side, we have Tennyson's poem In Memoriam, which is more about the faith in divine power and complete surrender to the Supreme God, whereas on the other, we have a poem like The Lady of Shalott that deals with the confining social ambience where a royal lady finds liberation only in her death. The Lady of Shalott represents the women of the Victorian society, the society that is ruled by a woman, Queen Victoria. It is ironic that the women folk during Queen Victoria's reign do not feel freedom and independence. If you remember, friends, the same pain is narrated in Robert Browning's poems, My Last Duchess and Porphyria's Lover. In both these poems too, the male persona, res respectively the duke and the lover, take command over the lives of their beloveds and consider themselves to be the rightful authorities who will decide whether their beloved should live or die. So to summarize, Tennyson's female persona, the Lady of Shalott, is suffering from an unknown curse. She is isolated from the real world. Whatever reality that she is allowed to witness is only through the reflections falling on a mirror hanging in front of her. Once the mirror gets cracked from side to side, when Sir Lancelot arrives, she foresees her darker future and immediately decides to put an end to her cursed life. She stops weaving and prepares herself to flee the tower of her confinement and attain liberation, unfortunately, in her death. Yes, it is unfortunate, friends, that the lady had to commit suicide to attain liberty. However, the same act should also be considered for her self-respect and courage as she quickly anticipates her darker future with the entry of the Lancelot and decides not to succumb to any temptation of life may be given by the Lancelot once he arrives in the tower. We end up with an image of a strong lady who is imprisoned by the parochial mindset of the conventional society of the Victorian time. So, this is it for today. I hope this will be helpful to you. Bye for now.